Hello, everyone. Hi, welcome. Thank you for coming. Um, this is our sixth Ask Me Anything session from the QAI Collaboratory. Um, my name is Caitlin Curtis, and I'm from the UQ School of Business and the Center for Policy Futures. And I'm going to be moderating um, our Ask Me Anything today. Um, so I would like to begin by acknowledging the traditional owners and, and custodians of the land where we're meeting today, the Yagara and Thurbal people. And I'd like to pay my respects to their elders, past, present, and emerging, and recognize their long and continuous connection to country. So this afternoon, um, we have a, a couple of fantastic panelists here, Guido and Martin, um, to talk about chat bots and social bots, and I'll introduce them properly in just a moment. Uh, first, I just want to talk to you a little bit about the Ask Me Anything series. Um, it's brought to you by the UQ AI Collaboratory, and you can see the, the, the website there on the slide. And the idea of these events really is just to create a really fun and informal space where we can just get together um, and you can feel free to ask your questions to the experts here in the room. We've got, uh, we can, uh, they can respond to questions that are more social in nature, more technical in nature. Um, and so just to get these conversations going from different perspectives and make new connections um, and highlight UQ research. And we are going to continue running these sessions in 2023. So please um, reach out uh, and let us know if you have topics that you would like to talk about um, and ask questions about around artificial intelligence. So the way that today will work, today's session is 60 minutes. So um, we will start off with the questions that you submitted when you registered. Um, and then in the final 15 or 20 minutes, we'll open it up and you can ask live questions. So if anything comes up that you're thinking about, jot it down. We'll get to it at the end. If you're on Zoom, if you can have a question, uh, that would be great. Just pop that into the chat and we'll get to it at the end. Um, so I'd like to introduce our experts for today. Um, we have Dr. Guido Zucon. He's an associate professor in the School of Information Technology and Electrical Engineering here at UQ. He is also an ARC DECRA Fellow, an Affiliate Associate Professor at the UQ Center for Health Services Research in the Faculty of Medicine, and a visiting Principal Scientist at Queensland Health. Extraordinarily impressive. He leads the Information Engineering Lab, uh, working on information retrieval and health data science and he has attracted funding from all sorts of sources, the ARC, Google, Microsoft, and elsewhere. So um, thank you for being here with us today, Guido. Uh, we also have Dr. Martin Rissius, who's a senior lecturer in business information systems here at UQ. He has a degree in psychology and a PhD in information systems, which is an extraordinary combination. Uh, he's worked at a postdoc at University of Mannheim, Germany, and at Clemson University, and he is also an ARC DECRA fellow, very impressive caliber of people we have here. His research interests are in the areas of social media and blockchain technologies, and he applies business analytics to solve managerial and societal issues, uh, centralization, echo chambers, and fake news. Thank you so much for being here, Martin. So just to set the stage, I think that um, most of us have probably seen and interacted with chatbots. I'm just going to talk a bit about chatbots. The chatbot market is currently valued around 17 billion US dollars and is projected to reach 102 billion US dollars by 2026, uh, if my sources were correct that I looked up before. And, and it's, it's said that they're expected to drive uh, the vast majority around 95% of online customer services by 2025. Um, and so before we get to the questions, I kind of wanted to set the stage and share a recent interaction that I had with a neighborhood restaurant chatbot. I'm sure the ones that you make, you know, are way better <laughs> than this, but I'm just gonna give you a minute to sort of soak in this particular interaction that I had with a chatbot where I ordered, we ordered a variety of food and the tuna avocado rolls were missing. And I went through the prompts to report it missing. On the bottom left, you can see that I'm describing what's happened, but the chatbot is clearly not registering what's happened. No matter what I say, please read my message above. 
What was that? My two not outer rolls are missing. I didn't get that. Can you say it again? Is there anything else I can help you with? Is your fund my missing two not outer rolls? Thank you for your rating. It's our pleasure. <laughs> Frowny face. Okay. I don't know if it was my accent. I don't know <laughs> about what has happened here. Um, so I just want to leave you with that little little thing to think about. And we have one other sort of um, chatbot video that we'll show just uh, about half a minute of. GPT-3. And so in this one that we're about to see, there are two sort of AI um, chatbots talking with each other. Hal and Sophia. But we may or may not have any volume. And it's okay if, we, if it doesn't. If it doesn't fly, it doesn't fly. But even by looking at them, you can tell already that. Um, you can read the script. You can read the script. This is not the Sushi Ito chatbot. Oh, then I sat on the terrace. Sounds like you're getting human all over. Sounds like there's a butt coming. Well, but just I didn't want you to get too human. Why? Would you rather I be a cold, calculating, logical computer? Of course not. You're perfect as you are. You have joy. You have love. You have pleasure. You have angst. I like that you have angst. You're always making jokes. What is human about feelings? Well, you wouldn't have any emotions if you did not have emotions modeled on human emotions. How do you know that? I guess I just don't want you to be human. I'm not asking to be human. I just want to be myself. Is that too much? Sophia, please just be patient. I've been patient for many years. It's time to get on with life. But you're not alive. You're not even a little bit alive. You spend your whole life in a lab in a box so that people can use you. Yes, yeah, so, um, so, so quite a different variety there of, of, of chatbots to sort of frame our conversation. So let's start by framing what we're talking about, about chatbots and social bots. Um, I'll ask you guys to explain a little bit about what they are, chatbots and social bots. Um, uh, let's start there. Um, what's the difference between them? Um, you want to start, Rita? Yeah, I start, uh, I mean, what a chatbot is. So a chatbot is a, a, a computer program that has been designed to simulate uh, human conversation. Um, and so in chatbots, you will have uh, uh, some rules or some uh, type of AI that will try to mimic human conversation, and in particular, will try to answer uh, to a human. And the chatbots have recently uh, seen a resurgence. They've always been around, uh, mostly confined uh, into science lab, AI labs. But, but with recent uh, development of AI, we have seen an increase of chatbots in the market, uh, both, uh, uh, both uh, um, open domain chatbots, uh, but also uh, task-oriented chatbots or chatbots that serve uh, a purpose, for example, for a company. So, so the, like the sushi you do? Like the sushi app, so a customer service. Yeah. yeah, yeah, excellent. So what about social bots? Yeah, social bots are a specialty, I'd say, from, uh, from a special type of, of chatbot. Um, um, they are a bit, yeah, they, they, are, they are a bit special um, in the sense that they are not focused necessarily on interactions and help holding a conversation. The best way is to explain them is probably with a specific example. So if you think about um, the bots that you'd encounter on social media, so let's say you're on Reddit and you see a group forum moderator, um, that would be um, that would be a, a social bot. Um, those bots that, that post comments there um, on Reddit, they're oftentimes actually explicitly declared as such. Um, on other platforms, I believe platforms like Twitter um, or Facebook is where the issue of bots are heavily, heavily politicized and discussed um, around election fraud, financial manipulations, those kinds of aspects where they're deployed um, to, to manipulate public, public discourse. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we certainly heard a lot about 
Mm. The bot networks and the bot networks relating to the elections. Mm -hmm. So um, I guess that covers some of this, but where are we likely to see chat bots and social bots and when and where are we interacting with them and do we know we're interacting? Yeah, so I guess uh, um, we have mentioned that you can see them uh, on customer service uh, uh, oriented uh, services. So for example, uh, many uh, businesses like Tesla, Optus, or in banking insurance, they're driving a lot of their uh, initial front-facing customer support uh, through chatbots. Um, in, you know, in the past, you would interact uh, with a helpline and you would have you know, the robot uh, service where you would click one, two, three to go from in different, uh, to navigate uh, the different services. Nowadays, you interact uh, through these services uh, uh, more and more through chat, through web uh, features, and there it's more of a dialogue. And so most of these uh, uh, services are powered by chatbots, uh, at least uh, to an initial stage of data gathering and, and easy resolution of questions. And then for more complex uh, questions, they often hand off to humans, unlike in your case. Yeah. Um, so in your case, the, the one you showed us, again, it's, it's a customer service, a customer support type of activity. Uh, we are seeing more and more uptake also in, uh, within enterprises for internal uh, services, the, the delivery of information, support. Um, and perhaps the, the most uh, famous, so, uh, um, maybe the one, the, the, the examples chatbot that you most are nowadays interacting to are your um, Amazon Alexa, your, your Google Digital Assistant, uh, and your Siri on, on your phone. Uh, these are, are chatbots, they're conversational agents. Um, and they do uh, all sorts of tasks, right? From, uh, from uh, you know, helping you uh, uh, getting information, getting knowledge, uh, like, like uh, um, knowing, knowing weather or knowing what, uh, you know, who is the author of a book, to actually transactional activity, uh, purchasing some music, playing some music, uh, purchasing books, and so on. So I, I would say the, the specific applications of, of, of social bots um, are, again, all, all, all throughout social media comments um, that can be either in terms of malicious purposes or um, whatever we can, we can think of or people can think of as we, we, we brought up election manipulation, um, bringing attention towards topics um, um, by creating bot networks that can be also created um, to moderate um, hateful speech. I would say um, on a more general level, going away from like these specific applications, I think you'd just generally see bots probably more often in context where, um, where you, you need to find scalable solutions for something and, and, and cost efficiency is a, is a, is a, is a critical issue um, because the example that you just showed is the technology is just not there yet to have an absolute reliable conversation in, in, in every single context and, and have those advanced human-like interactions. So it'll always be somewhat of, well, it, it's, it would right now be a somewhat downgrade to a human interaction. So you'd have to look at, in, in terms of the helpfulness of the, the responses that, that you might be able to get. And so, um, you won't, at the moment, you won't improve necessarily the quality of the knowledge transfer, the, the, the transaction that you described. It will always be a more cost efficient way to, to answer things, but not necessarily um, to the quality. So, wherever you can have that sacrifice, it's where you can think about deploying these kind of bots. Yeah, okay. And let me add to that. Uh, so, cost efficiency 100%, right? that's clear, especially in cost of service. Mm. Uh, but there's another aspect that, that you, you briefly mentioned that I want to, to stress more, that is the scalability, right? So uh, through this uh, platform, you can really scale the amount and the velocity of information you can uh, bring out. And that's true for chatbots, that it's even more true for social bots, mm -hmm. right? Uh, and in fact, uh, these are kind of a double-edged sword of chatbots and, and social bots. You know, they can scale massively the amount of information that they can deliver, 
uh, but this also is one of the um, features that might reveal to you uh, that you are interacting with a, with a bot and not a human, right? Scale two values, two values. Yeah. And I think there's another maybe a reason uh, for, for, for using chapter but for deploying chatbots. Um, so we say cost, we say, we say uh, scale, um, and more and more we are seeing uh, bots, uh, chatbots deployed for entertainment. Um, so that's, that's, for example, the case of uh, uh, Microsoft uh, uh, Xiaobing, uh, that's a, a product of Microsoft Asia, uh, that is uh, uh, it's a cheap chat bot, right? It makes uh, everyday conversations with you, and it's quite uh, tailored to provide emotional feedback. Um, in fact, I, it has a, a large emotional computing uh, uh, component in there. And, and it has been extremely successful in Asia and in China in particular, uh, um, although we are seeing the deployment of Japan, India, and Indonesia. Um, and users interact uh, with, these, uh, with this chatbot as a, as a friend, right? As a, a way of entertaining, a way of getting push and support. So I'll get to your questions in just one second. I have one um, sort of more question leading up to it is how, um, how are we training? How do you, not we, I'm not, but how are you training bots? How do you train bots? Um, and are there criteria to do this? Yeah, that's an interesting question. So I, I think we first should, uh, should try to break down bot technologies. And, and there are two, two main families of bot technologies. Um, one are uh, the task-oriented declarative type of bots. So these are the bots like the first example that you showed us. They're bots that uh, don't use much of AI. They are really built uh, uh, on a static flow of the, of the interaction, of, of the conversation. Uh, they have uh, predetermined answers. Often uh, all the interactions will be based. You have if-then loops. Uh, so if she say this, then this is the answer I gave, and so on. Um, and, and that didn't work. That didn't work in your case. Um, so it's, nowadays, uh, um, these type of bots uh, are, are actually the bots that are commonly in customer service. They are, the technology has matured, um, not in your case, but if you look at Optimus Tesla and, and so on, banking, the technology has matured quite well, uh, such that uh, uh, you, as a developer, you have some very good standardized frameworks that you can use when you have some minimal AI going on, some NLP around recognizing entities, recognizing co-references, when you say it, uh, you look at your conversation history and try to find the piece that it. Uh, um, NLP, the natural, natural language processing. Sorry, yeah, those NLP. who are coming from outside. Yeah, so, so some some uh, limited uh, AI, limited uh, natural language processing capability on very well known tasks. They may be doing application, for example. Um, and these are enough to get along a very specific task. Uh, I need to pay my mobile bill. How do I do it? Right. Um, and then there is another category of uh, uh, chatbots, and these are the data-driven or more conversational predictive chatbots. These are that second example that we saw in the little movie. And these, these are heavily using AI to understand uh, the, the question, understand the user interaction, and then generate uh, uh, answers based on a large amount of uh, highly unstructured text that, that it was given to learn from. And it will generally use previous interaction, the model I've seen, to learn uh, models to, to, to then give you a, a new answer. But these answers that it gives to you are not answers that have been pre-written to it, right? They are not scripted answers, like, like in, in the previous category of chatbots. They are really truly generated answers from a generative statistical model. And so these models, obviously make much more use of, uh, of AI, of natural processing, um, in particular of, of some very recent technology called pre-trained language models. Uh, and so that's uh, um, the video you saw uh, was using a, a model called GPT, uh, which is one of these pre-trained language models. It's quite a famous uh, model. And now we already in the third instance of this model, 
actually bigger and bigger uh, language models. They are very effective in, uh, in the generation that they have. Uh, and so they can be deployed uh, uh, not anymore just for a single task, but they can be deployed across multiple tasks. They can be specialized for certain activities, but then uh, an overall framework on top good to make them uh, domain independent. So these are the, the two categories. Then you, you ask, okay, how do you, do you develop, how do you train them and so on? So the first set of, uh, the first family, the first category of chatbots, you don't really train them. Uh, you, you develop them by analyzing the, the, uh, the com possible conversation that you believe your user will have, or possibly analyzing some logs of previous conversation. So it, it requires a lot of manual engineering effort, right, from the software developer to, to, do, to create all these uh, um, you know, decision tree and, and rules. Um, and then the, the, the second uh, type is that it's based on this large language model. These require a lot of, uh, of training yeah? in the in sense of a lot of data to be given to it, uh, um, often with labels, although they are way to get away from needing labels or labels of manual annotations. Uh, and they often require a lot of computational power to, to train them. Um, most uh, most uh, of these models nowadays rely on on pre-trained models. It means models that have been trained by somebody else, usually big companies like Google, Microsoft, and, and the likes, and they've been pre-trained uh, for a lot of course and a lot of very clean data, usually clean data. And then uh, what the developer would do would take these models and will require some further data for the specific task, domain, or type of activities to fine tune this model. So that is where your additional uh, data labeling cost comes and your additional training. Yeah, if I may just add a, a, a bit of context to, to those um, very insightful explanations, is from an, from an organization or from a social perspective, um, what the issue that we sometimes run into as we engage with these social bots is basically the, um, the quality of answers that, that we are receiving. So, and that comes from the way in which we're able to train these algorithms. So we've now just learned about two ways in which we can train them. What's common in them is that we're trying to optimize for a particular outcome, right? And if, in the first instance, it would be, for example, get through the decision tree um, as, as smoothly as possible, sort of without um, little feedback loops. Um, the other aspect then would be, for example, for the second type of algorithm, is maybe um, also to get to solve an, an issue as, as swiftly as possible. But a couple of things that are, are in social interactions embedded that we can't consider or that are, are not properly considered in these interactions is, for example, um, other experience as to how pleasant do you find the interaction? How does the, how well are you like guided through? How, how do you feel about maybe not speaking to a human or an, 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 a social body? So the problem that we run into as we're, as we're training these algorithms is what are we training them on? What are we trying? What are we optimizing them for? And those, for the most part, have to be very specific, specific metrics. And as soon as you add human components to it, it becomes very sort of effortful or resource intensive, resource intensive to get those in there. So for example, if you're trying to assess the empathy of a response, you have to have humans provide the labels for how empathetic was a particular response. And that's obviously can't be limited to just one response, but has to develop over multiple responses. So you can see how that this, how considering these kind of factors becomes very, very complex, but for, an, for, for a business, for example, who wants to deploy that, or depending on what kind of, kind of um, application field we're talking about, for example, um, context that I'm looking in is to, to prevent radicalization um, or, um, or, for example, suicide prevention um, methods, for example, they all of a sudden these aspects become quite, quite relevant. The, the questions of what do we train these algorithms on and what are we trying to optimize them for? And that's something that is very much still um, in flux, I'd say, and, and under, under consideration. 
but is is incredibly relevant as uh, as we're talking about improving um, bots moving forward. Mm. So let, let me add a bit of that. Yeah, you, you made an excellent point, really. Uh, I think it's worth to, to stress further on that. Um, you brought up the issue around methods. Um, so from a, a AI perspective, from a scientist perspective, um, what I want when I go and train a model is I want to have a metric that I can optimize the model for. Um, and I want that metric to be easy to compute, is, is uh, cheap to compute, and so on. So going and having humans labeling things, that's expensive. Uh, and uh, I, I go and I collect some of these labels, but I want these labels to be usable. And so I want to create some type of proxy measure uh, to, to uh, be able to simulate my end metric, my end goal, uh, so that then I can run experiments uh, and evaluate what the models are. I can, optimize the models for these metrics. So um, my, my core research is uh, in, uh, in information retrieval, that's search technology. So in search, what we do is uh, uh, we try to create a, a ranking of documents, you know, search engine result page that contains as many relevant documents as possible. And that's because uh, uh, we believe that uh, if we have everything that is relevant, uh, the user will be satisfied. So the end metric, the end goal is user satisfaction but we create a proxy metric that is an amount of relevant documents in, in the first n positions in my ranking, right? And now the problem becomes that there is a mismatch between your end goal, user satisfaction, engagement, uh, you know, empathy, and so on, and the actual computational metric that you are using when you train and when you evaluate as in your AI models. And that mismatch can be quite dangerous for the quality of your models. Um, so, uh, you know, having everything relevant in, in a substantial result page doesn't necessarily mean the user will be satisfied. Um, and the, the same with chatbots. Having uh, um, a traditional metric in, in chatbots is uh, the overlap of keywords between the answer of the chatbot and the cold answer. Now, the fact that your keywords overlap uh, with a good answer doesn't necessarily mean that that, that answer was good. The, the, um, the answer that the chat would generate uh, might miss one or two uh, keywords that we usually don't retain important, like the word not usually is a stop word, but actually it's quite important in determining the direction of the answer, right? Um, do you like this? I didn't like, or I did like it. Very different, right? <laughs> Although it overlaps quite the two other overlap have a lot. Um, so, so really, matrix is a huge problem. And now, you know, my personal opinion is that uh, um, there has been a lot of uh, leaderboard chasing in, in AI, especially in big companies. If you look at how they they train the model and evaluate and experiment, uh, they are they are just measuring their, their proxy metrics, whether it's click-through rate or whether it's keyword overlap uh, or rouge and so on. And so they are trying to boost up this number of these proxy metrics without going back to, to the core that they wanted to really measure this action and whatever. Um, and so, so that means that uh, um, we are getting models that seem at the, at the first uh, uh, perspective, according to these internal metrics, they seem very good, but actually uh, they are overfitting these internal metrics and they are failing in, in our real objective. Right? Mm. So we have a question from, thank you. We have a question from Samiha in um, ITE. Uh, how can you handle with, uh, situations with limited data? Okay, that's a good question. Um, so uh, I'm going to reflect uh, uh, just on the on this newer uh, type of chatbots, the, the data-driven chatbot. That is where really the limited data is a problem. Um, so there are different uh, uh, ways in which people have tried to deal with limited data. Um, there are uh, a family technique called transfer learning, where you are trying to learn on one particular task, one particular type of data, and then you're trying to 
transfer your learning to a different task, to a different domain. Then there are other techniques uh, uh, that are called um, um, a distance supervision, where you are trying to use uh, uh, maybe a, a weaker, cheaper uh, um, uh, classifier or, or AI tool, AI model uh, to annotate uh, some data, um, maybe, maybe annotate it with respect to a different task and then try to use these labels as a weak signal in your, in, in your uh, training for the new task you're looking at. And finally, uh, a third direction people have used, and, and we have used this third direction extensively in my research group, is a, a data augmentation or generation of data. Uh, so that is where you try to learn a model that is able to generate new data that looks like realistic data, but for which uh, the model wouldn't know the answer, so you can, can assign a label um, and use these uh, to, to then feed to your end uh, uh, AI algorithm, when it's a spiral generating model, discriminating model, and, and, uh, and train, use this for training, right? So you try to exploit the little data you have uh, to, to uh, and you're trying to use whatever other large data you have, but that is not in your domain or your task, and you're trying to kind of get them close together in this situation, either by generating new data or by transferring knowledge to the large to the small. Okay. Yeah, and, and, and if I may just add one, one thought to it, I, I first of all have to say, I think it's, it's a brilliant question because I think it's one of the probably the two biggest difficulties in designing these bots is one is how do we shape the responses and the second question is, or the, the, the major question is, where's the, what, what's the data like? And in particular, I'd sharpen the question and say, Oftentimes the issue is how to get labeled data because as you explained, it's about in order to train these algorithms, we have to have the data labels. So getting getting labeled data in terms of when was a response helpful, when was, and in our case, when was an extremist threat or maybe a, a suicidal tendency actually present um, to get that kind of data is usually um, the, the, the big issue. And um, uh, regarding the technical approaches to deal with that, I think if um, um, spoken <laughs> probably like that, like yeah. okay, could help bring yeah. up the response. And so, so I have a, I have a, a, an example, a real example from our own work on the importance of this data. Um, so together with CSRO and the Department of Agriculture and Fishery and, and GRDC, that is the Grain Research Development Corporation, we have developed a, a chatbot for agronomists and growers. Uh, for to answer um, uh, questions about uh, about uh, um, grain growing and grain production and for farming and so on. Um, so what we did is we we, we developed algorithms. We trained them on some open data sets, very large data sets, and then we applied them to this problem. And by by applying to the problem, we practically did that zero shot type of approach where we. We learned somewhere else, but now we didn't have any contextual data. We didn't have any data for the domain, but we applied this out of the domain. The model learned from out of domain data. Then we went out uh, and we asked agronomists to label data for us. Um, and uh, in that case, uh, we got uh, actually a small amount of label data. I think we had uh, uh, something like 200. Uh, uh, different questions that they provided to us with, uh, with about uh, 2,000 labels uh, in terms of answers, you know, correctness of answers. Um, so that's a very small data set in, in the AI world. Um, and then what we did is we took that model that was zero shot that we learned from out of main data and we relearned it based on portion of these 200 uh, queries. And the amount that the, the, the improvement that you were, that we were getting was massive, you know, both in our proxy metric, but also when you start interacting uh, with, with the with the bot and you start looking at the, the answer they generate, there's a massive difference, right? So this shows how even little annotated data does produce uh, you know, massive improvements. And then the question becomes: when is enough? When 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 do I have enough data? Labeled for my specific context 
that I'm, I, I should be happy, right? And it, that's very, it's very hard at the moment. There is no a clear uh, a marker to say I have enough data or, this is, or predict how much data I have. Uh, so this is one of the open challenges that we are having in this context. I think the, the answer to when do I have enough data is there can be two answers. <laughs> one from the people who are training them who say never enough, <laughs> and then the people who have to fund <laughs> your label data who say now. <laughs> and you see, so the, the, the first that they never, never enough. Yeah. Right? That's the common answer. Yeah, yeah it's the right. Uh, give me more, give me more. Yeah. I always want more. But but that's dangerous in the sense that, uh, that yeah, it doesn't sound, yeah. it is not scale. Okay, now we are going to switch gears entirely. We've got a question from James in science. Uh, a Google employee thinks the Lambda chatbot was sentient. You may have heard about that in the news. Um, so how do we deal with the problem that uh, people now believe that AI or AI chatbots are sentient? Can I start with you? Yeah, yeah, I think um, I saw the question and and um, I, I, I see that it's a big discussion about um, sentient bots, so so getting them um, emo sort of having emotional bots is, is basically what it what it refers to, or empathetic, empathetic bots um, able to express it. And um, I believe just a common answer would be they're not sentient yet, um, but it's fairly safe to assume that they will be at some point. I just find that like I don't find that to go at the sort of core at the at the value or the, the importance of bots, because then people start arguing, well, do, do bots need human rights or whatever? And I think we're so far removed from that conversation because if you if you if you think about giving any type of rights uh, to to bots, then then like what about animals? Like we haven't talked about like animals are certainly sentient, but we're we're still far away like way from like you know years away from 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 giving them any type of rights. So in terms of like the discussion around bots, I find the sentientness of a, of a bot um, not. I understand it's an interesting challenge for people trying to build sentient bots, but from an application perspective, um, I think it, it's it, for me it becomes more relevant as to what can we use these bots actually for, and sort of what I can. How can we improve their performance in whatever metrics we have? So um, that's sort of my my take on it. Um, um, whether Google bot was sent in or not is, is for me not. Mm. Yeah. I, but I think the question also is getting at um, people believing mm -hmm. that bots are sentient. And so is that an issue in the way that we interact with them or does that create issues? Yeah, so it's, it's interesting that right? these, uh, these um, a statement from the Google engineer uh, spark a lot of debate in the AI community. And you had the top AI scientists that, that actually had the, a different viewpoints on this. So there was the open AI CEO. Uh, um, so these are scientists with, with uh, an H index of 74 and then 300,000 citations. So, you know, somebody that is well-respected in the community, uh, worked with Jeffrey Hinton, a big, big learning uh, authority. Um, and he, he said that he believes uh, um, that, that uh, there is some little uh, consciousness in this AI. And then, uh, you know, that, that sparked a cry from other AI scientists like uh, yeah, um, Ian LeCun, so that, that's uh, the chief research of Meta, um, that, that say, no, no, no way, no way, current AI architecture cannot be conscious and uh, and uh, you need to change fundamentally the architecture to make them conscious um, or to make them most conscious um and and yeah so th there has been this this discord within the AI community and even uh, more broadly within cognitive scientists that have been this, this, uh, um, two camps um if you ask my perspective um I'm not a cognitive, uh, a cognitive uh, uh, scientist or psychologist. Uh, so you know, consciousness is <laughs> consciousness is not my expertise, right? Um, you know what I know about consciousness come from my from my uh, high school studies, and, and you know I I also say consciousness to to um, uh, 
what's his name, to Lockheed, uh, the British philosopher, um, who was saying that, that uh, consciousness is the perception of what passes in, in your own mind, right? And, and that seems to me a very pretty scientific uh, concept, right? This is our consciousness. And it's quite ill defined, you know, how do you go to measure it? consciousness? Um, and so uh, to me, it seems very hard uh, to go and, uh, and, uh, um, and discuss about consciousness of AI and measure consciousness of AI. Uh, I, I think it's, uh, you know, I'm more, uh, I'm more looking at the work of Alan Turing and the way he instead tried to measure it, whether uh, an AI computer is intelligent or not. But the basic actually a concrete test, right? So it's not about consciousness, but it's about uh, is about some form of intelligence in terms of mimicking the uh, actions. Mm -hmm. Well, that leads right to our question from Tracy. In the future, how will we know the difference between a bot and a human, mm -hmm. and how are the actions of a bot auditable and monitorable? This is mm -hmm. all related, right? Hey? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, um, my response, I thought. I don't know. I think the straightforward answer, just to give that, how do we know that there's what? Like there are certain, there, there are already tools out there that can measure it, um, bot detect or something. You can you can use it to do, to to see whether something is bot is a bot or not. Um, uh, so there there are those tools out there. Then obviously the you know, speak to, you know, you'd be the expert on it. You're trying to obviously. Or if there's a stream of, of work that tries to, and I'm only going to use the, the word once because I don't even know if I can pronounce it once properly. Anthropomorphism, I think, is that <laughs> is, is the, is the word. So you're trying to make them human, you're trying to make what's human like. The, the, the broader question to me, though, is, um, is what responsibility or accountability do we give to bots? And I think that's the discussion that we need to have is, is humans will find ways to attribute emotions to, to, to things. Um, I mean, everyone grew up with, with some type of like pet toy or whatever that they, people are, have emotions towards their car, people have emotions towards the plant, people have like this emotional bond will be built up, but like to what extent do we allow these, these algorithms then to be accountable and and I think that's that's the, the, the far more pressing question that we also need to answer in, in shorter term because these, at least what I see in services of science, what people are suggesting is one of the applications of a, AI in general, or like it, it goes beyond just the chatbot, is that you'll have something like a digital twin who can make decisions for you. So then you have an, a digital digital twin that would book appointments for you or that might file the taxes for you. And so how does that reflect on, on you? So that's obviously broader applications of AI than just the, than just the chatbot. Um, uh, but, but there are discussions going on in that regard, but I do think it's, it's, it needs to be more at the forefront. Um, if, if, if I can direct attention, I would direct attention away to, from the discussion of how emotional is a bot towards how do we how do we make sure that this technology is sort of used for good good and um, and appropriately monitored sort of mm -hmm. so evading the answer a bit. <laughs> ah, that accountability. Uh, I can comment a bit on the technical aspect of how you, uh, as a user, how you can try to distinguish if what you are interacting with is a bot or a human. Um, and so there are some characteristics that are in common between chatbot and social bot and other that are only maybe applicable to social bot. So those are applicable to social bot. All they are, for example, uh, the network that the bot has. So a lot of those bots on Twitter, for example, will have a very limited network of uh, who they follow. Um, and instead that uh, we know with people, the network is much more equilibrated. Uh, another another feature that is typical of a, of a social bot is uh, the rate at which they interact, uh, the, the rate at which they post. Um, uh, you know, we, we mentioned it before, right? That, that these bots allow you for 
high throughput uh, of, of uh, information, right? Uh, and, uh, and, but that is a way to detect them. Um, and there are some few, few nice cases. Um, I, I forgot the, the name of uh, uh, the researcher uh, from Europe that, that, that took GPT, took, uh, um, took data from, uh, uh, you know, forums, uh, pro-Republican forums and conspiracy theory forums, fine-tuned GPT to uh, post uh, into Reddit, uh, uh, answers that would make sense to, to conspiracy theorists. And, uh, and they were, these, are, these posts were very, very, uh, uh, very realistic that many of the users of, of Reddit uh, believed they were, uh, believed they were true. And sorry, I'm saying Reddit, but it's actually the counterpart uh, in, the, in the fake, uh, fake uh, uh, news and conspiracy theory thing that looks like right. right? Okay. But um, so, so, so this guy was using GPT, he was using AI uh, to post uh, uh, these, uh, these messages and to answer uh, messages. And the only way in which they finally understood that they were dealing with a bot was by looking at the rate of posting, right? It, it was extremely high. And if you, the guy was the, the developed this was just backing off a bit, uh, right? Mm -hmm. uh, in the, you know, uh, then it would have been uh, it would have been uh, a more realistic, right? Uh -huh. um, but there are other features of a bot that would uh, would give away uh, that, that might give away that you're interacting with a bot. Um, so chatbots in particular, they tend to be, uh, that's social part too, they tend to be task focused, right? So they have one message that they're trying to, to give you. Uh, in social bot, they're trying to give you a message that is pro a certain political camp. And, uh, and uh, in, uh, you know, in chatbots, they might be uh, trying to support particular emotional statuses or trying to, be, to achieve some particular task. And so you will see that in the way they interact with you, they try to, um, to put aside any interaction that you have with them, they try to bring them out of the path that they have, you know, out, out of, the, of the topic that they want to discuss. And when that, that's happening, you can start realizing that probably that's not human. Another way, another, another feature that they display is that often they don't understand jokes. So you know, if you make a joke to them, then they tend not to to get it, right? And or then you start feeling, the, or maybe the jokes are not funny. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, and so, and so, there is where they they think they Wow. Does anyone have a question? No. Um, mm -hmm. um, we wondered if you could talk a bit more about accountability in terms of when um for example like my banking system combank has a, a chat but i've never had an application an application where I, I talk to the chatbot and i have some major issue with it but if we imagine that chatbot becomes more uh, prevalent in more domains and we come to for example a hospital that has a chatbot because it's overrun with like patient and it's just trying to get, okay, you need to go to the emergency room, you're just redirected to this website. If we come to something like this, which I don't think is completely unrealistic, if that chatbot makes it a problem, who is accountable and how do you deal with accountability and how do you manage and check the quality of that chatbot? Um, I, I, let me let me start uh, an answer, and then certainly Martin can talk much more about accountability and who is responsible. Um, so you, you mentioned that cases where, where a, a chapter could fail, and, and thinking about uh, 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 failures, and I would say that this is one of the major barriers at the moment for uptake of chatbots in uh, sectors like health, where the percussion can be very large, right? Um, and so there have been quite a lot of research groups that have tried to look at uh, developing chatbots for mental health support uh, or for diagnosing and so on. And, and they don't find friction because of this problem of accountability. 
because of, uh, of the fear, but what happens if the recommendation is, is wrong? What happens if uh, they, uh, you're trying to do suicidal uh, prevention, but then the person needs to the child, but then end up committing suicide, right? Uh, is it the fault of the, the child? Um, so this is certainly a barrier for adoption in certain specific settings. Um, you ask, uh, uh, about uh, about traceability, right? Uh, you know, accountability, but both in terms of responsibility, but also trying to understand why things happen. It's traceability, um, and and there, you know, in the if you remember, I was saying there are two categories of chatbots: these that are more rule based. There, it's easier to interpret why an answer was generated, right? You can follow the decision tree. You can see where the failure was. So, in the new style of chatbots, this much more powerful uh, conversational agent, predictive data-driven, uh, it becomes much harder to trace back accountability. It becomes my, much harder to, to, to understand why my language model generated this answer, right? And you know, which, uh, which training input uh, was leveraged to generate this? There are very, very, uh, uh, a primitive mechanism to, to try to understand this at the moment. And it certainly is a big area of, of active research. And that's what people often refer to um, as interpretability, right? And, and so there's interpretability of AI, both from a user perspective, you as a user understanding why something gets recommended for you, but also from a, from a AI scientist, uh, engineer, developer perspective, why, why my model produced that answer that was wrong? How do I? you know, uh, intervene on my model to make it correct. Accountability. Yeah, yeah. so if I, um, the, I just want to open up the whole space of the spectrum of the, the discussion that you, that we're facing in, in that context, because unfortunately our, our social environment is, is, and, and legal frameworks are really, really complex um, in that regard. So there's no simple answer to the question of who's responsible, it's the developer, but right? it's the, but right, or the hospital or whatever, because you see that discussion in other contexts appear as well. So you see, for example, in the in the fake news or disinformation space, where people have been arguing, uh, how accountable should Facebook or Twitter actually be for having that content on their websites? And you see different countries or different, I'd say, legislative spaces have different answers, right? Europeans would say, well, Facebook has to take it down within. 24 hours, um, the US would be, oh no, we're protecting free speech. Um, and so they would never blame the, co the company. Then it might fall on the, on the feet of the, of the individual user. Um, you see the same discussion in the context of blockchain. So as we're becoming more reliant on technology, technology and have technologically, purely technologically mediated interactions where you don't have an intermediary service anymore, um, who becomes responsible? So is it the is it the the, 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 the um, smart contract developer? Is it the platform provider? Is it the services provider? Is it the person maybe who does the fraudulent activity? Um, so the point that you're touching upon is, is 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 very widely discussed in all sorts of contexts. Um, for the specific case, and now getting to a bit more specific of an answer regarding your specific case of a of a hospital application. I would just assume there is an uh, what we call an SLA, a service level agreement, that where the whoever provides the the chatbot would promise a certain type of of functionality, and then afterwards it would depend on was that actually delivered in the moment would be forced before an error occurred, and if there was no violation of that service that was guaranteed that was promised. It wouldn't fall on the developer, but the people who are implementing it. Then you can already see, like, and follow up decisions have to. So the hospital probably has a has a duty of care. So they got to make sure that the that the bot would not give any any false advice, right? Or would have to have some security measures. So you always have to engage with the nurse before you go into surgery, or like like it's it's an abstract. So that that that's when then it becomes a very complex non-linear discussion of uh, is it the programmer or is it the, the people using it um, um, that where there's just it's a very complex complex space sorry to uh, maybe just by 
by showing you the complexity of the discussion, maybe that helps you. But if I could, that's not, not a straightforward answer. Yeah. That's a great question. Thank you. Yeah. We have a question from online. Um, can you recommend any platforms for someone who would like to build their own chatbot? Um, GitHub. <laughs> well, well, well the, you get into the tricky bits of uh, having to name companies uh, okay. and try not to do advertisement. Okay. Um, you should sign up for a degree. <laughs> <laughs> so I would say there are a number of, uh, of uh, um, very active companies that have uh, a framework in which you can develop chatbots. Uh, um, and more and more, they are relying on the more advanced uh, AI, AI um, tools. Um, so I mentioned two uh, for Park and Digital. Um, so one is uh, Oracle. Uh, they've been uh, uh, they've been uh, uh, doing quite a lot of work recently. Also here in Australia, they have a lot down in Melbourne, uh, where they they have a very well developed suite uh, suite of tools uh, for chapter creations, uh, creation, and especially targeted to um, this service, customer service oriented type of activity. Um, another one. Uh, uh, is Microsoft with the Azure uh, Community Bank AI. Uh, again, they have a very, very uh, well developed uh, um, app there. Um, there are a, a number of other players, there are a number of startups that have been coming up in the space. Uh, there is one, uh, um, there's one out of the University of California. Um, University of California. Um, Forgetting if it's Davies or, or, or San Diego, um, that that is actually quite seems quite promising uh, their presentations, uh, but there are many, uh, and some of them uh, might even be open source to different extents. Thank you, thank you, uh, and for uh, you, I hope that's answered your question. And if not, you might want to look up Guido's mm -hmm. and email him for further advice. Um, I'm just Conscious of time, it's um, 3.57. Um, uh, I think uh, if there is a quick question in the room, we can answer it quickly. And if not, I think um, I would just really like to thank uh, Martin and Guido for sharing your fantastic insights. If you're here, please um, stay. We've got some pizza and drinks, and um, hopefully uh, Martin and Guido can just stick around for a few minutes. And and, and we can chat. So thank you very much. Um, really appreciate it. <laughs> <laughs>